Hello. Encryption. So I was very interested in encryption. <clears throat> but I was never really... I was interested in it. I liked the idea. Well, I was a hacker, so... I mean, security is my... My history. Uh, it was my focus for a long time. And I got to a point where I was just like, alright, chill out, alright? Chill. And then the whole, uh, you know, intel garbage. It's like, well, I understand enough of, I have, I have enough technical knowledge to be able to say, that's not going to happen unless they put a bug in every computer. And then, they put a bug in almost every computer. So, <laughs> yeah. Um... Hmm. See that the you when I was a kid, like my dad and I would we'd go into a bank and be like, alright, how do you rob this bank? I do this and then you do that and the cameras are there and then you do this. It was like a, a exercise that we would play. Like circumventing security. So it was always kind of kind of of interest to me. My dad was a cop, so he was he was always thinking about this stuff anyways. Maybe I got it from him. Uh <clears throat> But that was my first, uh, my first real gig was uh, doing penetration testing for uh, the first company I worked for. And uh, I wound up taking over that division. Division. It was that part of the company. I, I was in charge of the security side entirely. <clears throat> but security just became kind of a chore to people. It's like, oh, you know, any publicly traded company, this is all neither here nor there. I did a lot of security stuff, and I was interested in security stuff. And then I was just like, alright, you know, chill out a little bit. So I didn't encrypt everything. Uh, cryptocurrencies, by the way, legit. That's serious stuff. That's real. And it's real interesting. Until we solve, like, the... The... Uh, quantum computing problem. Then that breaks everything. But that breaks the entire world, just about. When quantum computing can solve... Uh, can solve for any mathematical equation. Still, in the back of my mind was that uh, that idea that a computer might solve for any mathematical equation at some point, and that's what got me so interested in the uh, in the manual process of a one-time pad. And a one-time pad is uh, technically the only form of mathematically unbreakable encryption. But it has other features, which are particularly interesting. Uh, the one-time pad is a very simple cipher. Uh, it uses an, a standard XOR, you know, number uh, A plus A equals B, um, you know, that kind of thing. It's a very simple, simple process. You can do it on a sheet of paper. Uh, and that's what they did in, in uh, with the spies in World War II and all that. And uh, what was particularly interesting was that if the if the key that you use, so you have a, a cipher, and that cipher can be completely public, completely public, which is something that is uh, kind of different from uh, modern encryption, because if you share enough encrypted data, you can you can collect some data off of it, you can collect some consistencies off of it. Uh, but if you share a one-time pad information, bit of information, cipher, it's completely random. It is completely random. And the reason it's completely random is because your key is completely random. And it assumes two... Yeah, it, it assumes just two things. It requires two things. One, that your key be completely random, uh, which is... I'm not sure if we're talking about totally, perfectly random, but you can't do a random number generator on it. Um, there are a number of processes and even hardware, bits of hardware that allow you to do a lot of randomization. But if you want to, you can just roll die. Uh, but that your key be random and that your key not be reused. So as long as your key is random or quite random or semi-random, pseudo-random, 
and your key is not reused, you're fine. 100%. Uh, it is unbreakable. Mathematically unbreakable. Period. Because you're not using a mathematical function or a process to generate this, except for a simple XOR. Uh, or a simple... What is it called? Is it phase shift? It's where you add something to a total. Oh, man. Add something to a total, and then when you reach a total, it starts over again at the beginning. Dang. Okay, well, you know, you know what that is. Anyways. The interesting feature of it, or interesting features are, first of all, it has, it can be shared, that cipher can be shared anywhere, anyhow, anyway, doesn't matter. It's completely open. You can share it however you want. Um, the second thing is that it does not have one solution. Because the key is completely random, and because the process of translation is so simple, you can... You can solve anything to anything else with the same key. Uh, that is, if I give you uh, Q, X, Y, M, that's four letters, it's four letters of a cipher. With the correct key, that solves to, uh, you know, tree. With an alternative key, that solves to um, seed. With an alternative key, it solves to bike. So what you have is not necessarily a mathematical problem that you're trying to solve or trying to find the solution for, because there are there is one solution for a mathematical problem, particularly in encryption. trying to figure out which is the correct one. So, a computer cannot solve this problem because a computer will solve the problem to as many um, well, as many logical combinations that you can make with four letters. And if it's in another language, who knows? Um, <clears throat> so the idea is that you have something that has multiple Solutions, and they would uh, the spies in World War II would have um, one-time pad key sets that they would have little little tiny things like this big and this thick um, with tons of key information on it, and then the keys would um, it, was, it was made of flash paper, so it would just burn up in uh, it would burn up or it would melt in water. Uh, but they would have a a, re, a, a proper key set. And then they would have a wrong key set, or they would have an alternate key set. And the alternate key set would res would um, would decrypt the information to an alternative message. So if they were captured, or if someone got that key set, or started to solve it, they would solve it for uh, seemingly correct but inaccurate uh, information. And when you think about that disinformation and misinformation is more of an indicator than anything else um, or gives you more information than even the correct solution so if I say uh, you know meet here meet here at this time at this date uh, and that's the real message but the secret message or even the duress key is resolves differently then you can see you can go to the place where that resolves differently and see if someone shows up there you know pretending to be that person then you know that the key is compromised there's there's lots of little games you can play with stuff like that with disinformation but the point is a computer can't solve for it because you're not reusing the same key and the thing you use to generate the keys uh, is random or is you know, pseudo random so that means you can share all this information as, as easily as you as easy as you want as easily as you want. Uh, but the the downfall of it is you're not allowed to reuse the key information. You're not allowed to reuse 
uh, any key information. And the key needs to be random. So generating random numbers is relatively easy at this point. You know, it can be done uh, pretty well. Or it can be, you know, randomly mixed up with a series of uh, functions that just kind of jostles the data around so it doesn't resemble what it had before or what it was before or what it generated. Um, but the, the difficulty was carrying the key. Because if we meet up once a year, I have to give you key information for an entire year. And that key information, you know, the longer that key information exists, the harder it is to keep track of. Uh, and then, I mean, like, the more likely it is to be compromised. Whereas if we have a key exchange, you know, more frequent key exchanges, we have the opportunity to change that data. Because the difficulty lies in someone uh, subvert subverting that data, you know, getting that data and then saying, all right, now I'm just going to listen in because you're going to broadcast the cipher information unchecked and then you know, anyone can pick it up. But someone who made a copy of the key can be translating the entire time. So the longer your key is, if that key gets compromised, the more data you wind up getting lost. So part of the difficulty was having just a big enough key, but you know, data storage nowadays is ridiculous. We can have amazing things, and we can have, actually have things like USB drives I'm not talking about like super advanced forensics, uh, but we can have USB drives that uh, have passcodes on them that will burn up, or uh, buttons or switches, or heck, if you want, you can even set it up so that it has a magnet on it. With no outward appearance, you need to put a magnet right here when you plug it in and keep it there, otherwise you're going to have a bad time. Um, but the key... I had originally thought of uh, making this process as simple as possible. And the way I came up with it was having either a browser, not a browser extension, um, a, what's called a bookmarklet. Uh, and they've kind of died with uh, Chrome because Chrome had just made updates to it. I still programmed one. Uh, <clears throat> and it's made to take any type of input. so. The idea was that you, and this is this is something moderately subversive about using someone else's platform and denying them the information, um, such as Facebook. So if you get on Facebook and you post uh, ciphered information, then someone can go on their Facebook feed, see that you posted a bunch of uh, gobbledygook, click the button. And then on their client side, on their browser side, nothing that touches Facebook's server, it translates that post into its intended message. And it'll translate it in place. You can even do it with pictures. I have tried this. The problem is Chrome, and I think... No, I don't think Facebook does it. Chrome, certain pages, and Chrome, Chrome's standards, actually. Uh, that was like just four years ago they changed it. Doesn't allow off-site JavaScript to run. So that means if you reference anything that's outside of the, the current site's domains, then it doesn't run. Unless you run it as a, uh, as an, a, br a browser extension, which means you're registering all the code and everything like that which is, well, it's exactly what they want. The alternative is to have that Facebook post and then click, you know, select the, the code and then go to another tab and drop it in there and translate it there. Seems very disjointed.